is still remaining in Gaza, still waiting for a deal that will bring them home. It is time to finalize that deal. We are just 10 miles from Mar-a-Lago, home of one Donald J. Trump. He calls it the Winter White House. I call it his retirement home. The families actually put out a very strong statement defending me. They said, we asked him to be there. Hello, everyone. I'm Major Garrett in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Trump are both traveling through battleground states this week. The Harris campaign officially launched their, quote, fighting for reproductive freedom, unquote, bus tour today in Palm Beach, Florida, home of, among other things, Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort. Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar and Florida Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz were among those who addressed supporters. After campaigning in Pennsylvania over the holiday weekend with President Biden, the vice president heads to New Hampshire tomorrow. Meanwhile, Trump is scheduled to address a fraternal order of police event in Charlotte, North Carolina, Friday. His running mate, J.D. Vance, will be in Phoenix, Arizona, and San Diego, not far from the Mexico border, this week. Caitlin Huey Burns and Aaron Navarro join us now. Caitlin, I want to talk to you first about where Vice President Harris will prepare for the debates. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, hello, biggest battleground state on the map. Yeah, Pennsylvania is the whole ball game. I mean, you talk to both campaigns and they say they're essentially trying to park there as much as they can because really both campaigns can't get to 270 without Pennsylvania. And when you look at kind of where she's going, and Aaron can speak to this because he was just there, but you look at where she's going, she's trying to cut down the margins in some of those Trump areas, right? Win by, or not necessarily win some of those Trump areas, but lose by less is kind of the strategy. And the Trump campaign, I mean, going back to when J.D. Vance was announced as the running mate, um, they essentially said that they want to, you know, put J.D. Vance in Pennsylvania as much as possible and all those, you know, blue wall states. Um, that is the ball game. That's where the first debate will be just a week from today. Aaron, dig a little deeper on Pennsylvania and the Harris campaign's approach. They need it. The Trump campaign needs Pennsylvania as well to get the 270 Electoral College votes. I was just there in Pittsburgh Big Labor Day Union Hall event with President Biden, Vice President Harris. She's going back to Pittsburgh to do debate prep. She's going to camp out there and then make it back out to Philly for the debate. But this is a state that you're going to see Josh Shapiro in. President Biden has said he would campaign a lot in as a surrogate to help make sure that they deliver that commonwealth. And when you look at where she's going, western part of the state, uh, maybe some areas that maybe lean a bit more Republican surrounding Allegheny County. That's that big Democratic county where Pittsburgh is and they need to make sure that Harris is defined in those voters' eyes. Pennsylvanians know Joe Biden. It's his second home state. Defining Harris is going to be their campaign's mission. And talk about this concept that Caitlin and I identified as lose by less, meaning what? How, does, how, do, how, do, how should our audience think about that? At least in places like Pennsylvania, Georgia, Democrats I've talked to say they want to really play in rural areas. These are not counties they're expecting to flip uh, on, on a dime, but maybe going from a 75% Trump to 25% Harris loss to something closer to a 60-40 could really make the difference, especially in these states where the margins were so close in 2020, and at least the Harris campaign's posture has been it's going to be potentially even closer this time around. Kayla, when I play for you for something that President Trump said over this weekend about the 2020 election and what his rights were or weren't. Let's play that. Whoever heard you get indicted for interfering with a presidential election where you have every right to do it, you get indicted and your poll numbers go up. You had every right to get, not, not involved, interfere. Interfere. This is a difference, and it's an important one, ladies and gentlemen, because previously those around the former president, and even he, said he was just raising questions. Mm -hmm. Raising questions is fundamentally and legally different than interfering. He chose the word interfering. And campaigns have every right to bring about legal challenges after Absolutely the vote. Absolutely every and right. he did, and all of those uh, challenges were not won. They found no Which evidence Which means you're of, obliged to accept the legal verdict it, after you have exercised your right to challenge. Exactly. And we are four years removed from that. And I've been covering his campaign very closely. Uh, he has not uh, strayed away from the, those remarks about 
those falsehoods about the 2020 election. And even as his campaign is trying to focus voters on having faith in the electoral system, at the end of every rally, they urge voters to vote by mail if they can, to vote early if they can, to make sure they kind of bank those votes, knowing that that really can make the difference. Meanwhile, you have the principal uh, still not acknowledging the results. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I interviewed uh, the former president. Yes, and did. I asked, you know, will you accept the results of the election? He said, if it's free and fair. Well, we asked also, what does free and fair mean? And he noted, which I think is notable, that he said that there have been changes in Implemented over the past four years <clears throat> that he believes will make this a, in his words, freer and more fair election. Um, there have been changes in Georgia and other states. Uh, so, you know, we're just kind of clocking that on mm -hmm. the on the map here. Uh, but again, has not once acknowledged the results. Georgia, North Carolina, Florida all made some alterations to their procedures after 2020. Those are all places on the map. Aaron, this reproductive rights bus tour begins in Florida. No coincidence there. What is the most current Harris campaign thinking about the possibilities, probabilities of Florida? Oh, interesting. Uh, look, Democrats in Florida will always argue to you that the state should be in play. There should be more investments made. Should doesn't mean is. Yes. And from talking to Democrats and the Harris campaign, it doesn't seem like they are making Florida a key battleground. They're at least making some plays in there, in part to troll former President Trump. As Amy Klobuchar said in that bite you showed, 10 miles away from Mar-a-Lago, this comes the week after he was kind of pressured to say that he would vote no on that ballot initiative that would essentially enshrine abortion rights in that state. So they're starting, yes, in Florida. They have another stop in Jacksonville tomorrow, and they're going to Savannah, back to another more traditional battleground state. But at least to Democrats there, they say having a presence here helps with those ballot measures and maybe creating the infrastructure for some elections down the road. And forcing the Trump campaign possibly to keep an eye on Florida in ways he would prefer not to. Aaron Navarro, Caitlin Huey Burns, as always, thank you very, very much. We will have full coverage of the first presidential debate between Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Trump one week from tonight. America Decides will be live from the spin room in Philadelphia at 5 p.m. Eastern. And the debate itself hosted by ABC News, can quite happily be watched by you right here starting at 9 p.m. Eastern. We are following some breaking news. Federal prosecutors have announced new charges against several Hamas leaders. For more on this, CBS News Homeland Security and Justice reporter Nicole, Nicole Skanga joins me now. Nicole, what is the latest? What can you tell us? Yeah, Major, we are still reading through this 38-page complaint breaking moments ago, but it indicates Six defendants, all of them part of Hamas's leadership structure, Abu Ibrahim, Mohammed Daif, El Khalid El Daif, Abu Bara, Abu El, El Walid Ali Baraka, knowingly provided Hamas with material support and resources, including services, property, personnel, all of this part of a conspiracy to murder U.S. nationals, bomb a place of public use, and use a weapon of mass destruction against Americans. There are seven total charges here. Now, these defendants, they are the former chairman of Hamas's Politburo, the leader of Hamas in the Gaza Strip since 2017, the commander-in-chief and deputy commander of the al Qassam Brigades, Hamas's head of national relations abroad. The activity in this complaint dates back to at least 2001, but it includes the atrocities that unfolded on October 7th and everything since. And according to this complaint, at least 43 American citizens were among those murdered, and at least 10 American citizens were taken hostage or remain unaccounted for, of course, on October 7th. Uh, now, it goes on to describe some of the activity by Hamas, saying Hamas terrorists attack civilians, firing handguns, assault rifles, and handheld rocket launchers in a small residential communities. Uh, this complaint also saying that during the October 7th massacre, Hamas terrorists weaponized uh, sexual violence against against Israeli women uh, engaging in rape, Hamas also targeting civilian populations with a barrage of rockets and, you know, claiming its fighters fired more than 5,000 such rockets at towns and cities in southern Israel. Of course, this indictment also coming on the heels of the discovery of six hostages killed in a Gaza tunnel. And on Monday, uh, hundreds of thousands of Israelis took the, to the streets, demanding the government do more to free others held captive by Hamas. Thousands were also in a 
attendance at the funeral of one of those hostages killed, Israeli-American Hirsch Goldberg, Poland, and Attorney General Garland releasing a statement just literally moments ago saying that this weekend we learned that Hamas murdered six more hostages, including Goldberg, Poland. He goes on to say the Department of Justice is investigating that murder in each and every one of the brutal murders of Americans and saying the Department of Justice is going to continue to support an all-of-government effort to bring those Americans still being held hostage home, uh, noting that the charges that were unsealed today are just part of one effort, uh, you know, one aspect of Hamas's operations and DOJ's efforts to go after them. These will not be the last efforts by the Department of Justice. Attorney General Garland saying DOJ has a very long memory. Major. With all the developments on this breaking news story, Nicole Skanga, thank you very much. Thanks. Related to all this, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu remains defiant on ceasefire terms as grief over Israeli hostages found dead in Gaza fuels outrage. Where negotiations for a deal stand or don't stand, that's next. You're streaming America Decides. For 23 years, I was privileged to have the most stunning honor to be Hirsch's mama. I'll take it and say thank you. I just wish it had been for longer. Welcome back to America Decides. That was Rachel Goldberg Poland in Jerusalem yesterday delivering a eulogy for her son Hirsch, who was one of six hostages found dead in Gaza. This as Israeli protesters took to the streets in Jerusalem over what they describe as the government's failure to secure a ceasefire and hostage deal. I want to bring in our MTS Taib from Tel Aviv. MTS, what can you tell us? Well, Major, as you can see, Israelis have come here to the center of Tel Aviv for a third night of protests following the killings of six hostages in Gaza. And they say that Prime Minister Netanyahu is squarely to blame for those killings, and they're calling on him to call for a ceasefire and hostage release deal in Gaza to bring the remaining 100 or so hostages home. But we heard from Prime Minister Netanyahu last night where he started off with a bit of contrition, asking for, quote, forgiveness for not being able to bring the hostages home alive. And then very quickly, he pivoted, being extremely defiant, saying that his plan will not change, that he and the Israeli military will continue their presence in southern Gaza and what's known as the Philadelphia Corridor, saying that it was vital that they did that. Now, for Hamas's part, they say that they will not accept any agreement which sees Israeli forces in Gaza anywhere, let alone along the Philadelphia Corridor, which is really the border with Egypt. But as you can see behind me, so many Israelis so angry and in so much pain and are just desperate for the war in Gaza to end and for the hostages to come home. Major. On the scene for us, as always, MTS Tayeb, thank you very much. I want to bring in the managing director of the Washington Institute for, for Near East Policy, Michael Singh. It's great to see you, Michael. Explain to the audience Netanyahu's political calculations. He sees the protests, but he also knows he has a coalition government that if he moves in the direction that the protesters are urging, begging, shouting at him to move, his government is likely to fall. True? Well, I think that's right. He's uh, obviously dealing with a war which has been going on for almost a year. And so you have protesters on the streets who I think are saying, look, at this point, we have accomplished all we're going to accomplish militarily, and our priority needs to be on getting our fellow citizens home. Uh, and the killing of the, the brutal killing of those six hostages in the tunnels under Rafa uh, just recently, I think, sort of brings home the idea that you have perhaps still dozens of Israelis there. If you can get them out, let's get them out. And they were, if I read correctly, Michael, probably among those who would have been released in earlier iterations of a ceasefire hostage release agreement. That's right. They could very well have been on the list of those to be agree to be released in a first phase of a hostage deal. Uh, obviously, we, we can't know. Can't know that for sure. Um, but then he, you're right. He has major folks on the other side in his coalition, you know, in his own Hard party. Hard right coalition government. Exactly. Hardliners who say, look, at the end of the day, we need to make sure that we 
essentially brook no compromise with Hamas. We can't allow something like October 7th, those terrible attacks which took place, to ever happen again. Uh, and that means ensuring an outcome that essentially destroys Hamas. Talk to our audience about what MTS referred to, this Philadelphia corridor. It's a new term. I wasn't familiar with it until about 48 hours ago. Probably I should have been. Why is it important and is it the most important sticking point or just one of many? Well, it's one of many sticking points, but it's a very important one. It's important because the Philadelphia corridor is a narrow strip of land between the Gaza Strip and Egypt. It's essentially meant to be a demilitarized zone in the Egypt-Israel peace treaty. Um, when Israel initially withdrew from Gaza in 2004, it was controversial then whether Israel should remove its troops from that corridor because there was a lot of worry that arms would flow from Egypt through that corridor into Gaza and Hamas could, could arm. Now, Israel ultimately withdrew its forces from that corridor, and that's exactly what happened. You know, we, we do believe... Arms did flow in. Arms did flow in. We believe that actually this is how Hamas was able to assemble this massive armament it used on October 7th. And Netanyahu is under a lot of pressure to assure that that never happens again. But again, you have to balance that against all the other considerations like the release of hostages. And when you take a look, Michael, at these long-running ceasefire hostage exchange negotiations, do you have any shred of optimism? I don't have much optimism, and it's because even though we're talking now about the divisions within Israel uh, over what to prioritize, and we've seen some divisions between the U.S. and Israel, there's another party here, and that's Hamas. And it seems as though Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas, is really the one party in the region who is content to see this war go on. And until we see from Hamas a desire for a ceasefire, these discussions about prioritization are academic. And explain to our audience, if you can, Michael, and it's a hard thing to explain, that belligerence from the leader of Hamas inflicts untold damage on Palestinian civilians who are not fighters in Hamas, all manner of destruction of infrastructure and things essential to the lives of those non-combatant civilians, and yet they, do they sort of tolerate it or do they have no choice? Well, look, I think the leadership of Hamas, in fact, welcomes it. I think they see the international pressure building on Israel. The trade-off is suffering amongst Palestinians. And, you know, Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas, I think doesn't care about suffering amongst Palestinians. Palestinian people themselves are, are living with guns to their head. You know, they're uh, obviously in a state of war, but they're also living, living under intimidation from Hamas. And they haven't had a leadership for decades now, which has really represented them well, represented them responsibly there. And that is among one of the many, many layered complexities of this region and this particular conflict. Michael Singh, thank you very much for your help. Ukraine officials say a Russian missile strike on a military training facility in nearby hospital today has killed more than 50 people. The two ballistic missiles struck a city 200 miles southeast of the capital of Kyiv, injuring more than 200 people. This appears to be one of the deadliest attacks carried out by the Kremlin since the war began. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says, quote, Russian scum, unquote, will be held accountable. Something weird is happening as Democrats down ballot look to Tim Walls to help boost their reelection chances. Our Scott McFarland takes a look at the VP candidate's impact on the 2024 race. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. As we mentioned at the top of the show, a bus tour promoting Kamala Harris's support for reproductive rights is now underway after kicking off in Palm Beach, Florida. Molly Ball and Sabrina Rodriguez are here to talk about all this. Molly is a senior political correspondent for The Wall Street Journal. Sabrina is a national politics reporter for The Washington Post. Molly, let me start with you. Um, I asked Aaron Navarro about this. Starting this particular tour in Florida, there's a ballot initiative there, and there's this running debate within the Democratic Party and the Harris campaign. How real are the prospects in Florida? What's your sense? We'll know that they're really competing in Florida when they start dropping tens of millions of Correct. dollars there. And that's what hasn't happened yet. However, there is an outside chance that Florida does come on the map for exactly the reasons that you just articulated. Uh, and uh, abortion in particular is the issue that if anything is going to put Democrats back on the map in Florida, that's going to be what it is, not only because there is this ballot initiative, which is polling quite well right now. It does need to get 60 percent in order to pass, but it would restore uh, reproductive rights. Florida currently has the, the six-week ban that 
uh, Governor Ron DeSantis signed. Uh, Florida Which even is, former President Trump says is too much. Which even President Trump says is too much. And Florida is the most pro-choice red state. Of the, of the states that have uh, reliably gone for Republicans in the last few cycles, uh, Florida is the most socially liberal. And so that's why this, is, this looks like an issue to many Democrats that could actually put the state in play, even though it has trended Republican for the last several cycles. And Sabrina, I think it's worth saying in 2022, Democrats in Florida were demoralized. They did not have a standard bearer. The state party was not well either funded or organized. Things feel a bit different. That doesn't mean it's determinative, that it's going to be on the, on the map in a way that's super competitive, but it does feel like Florida Democrats feel more energized and focused this time around than in the most previous cycle. Absolutely. And I mean, something that, that Democrats in Florida are saying, those who are working on the ground, is that they understand that this might not be something that, oh, they win in 2024 and suddenly everything has shifted and it's suddenly a big swing state. But if they can even show that they have made some types of gains, because in 2022, Governor Ron DeSantis won re-election by double digits. <laughs> it's not, yeah. we're not talking about a few thousand votes and the tight races that we know Florida for. Um, it was a decisive win. So a lot of Democrats are saying, you know, they're, they're kind of projecting that big confidence, oh, Florida is in play. But the quiet part they're saying is, even if we don't win, if there is some type of momentum, things like this reproductive rights tour, if there are people coming to Florida, if there is even some money that gets spent, it could just help towards them showing that, okay, all hope is not lost. And Molly, you know, every national campaign is a battle over finite resources. And if there is something that is percolating in Florida that attracts the Trump campaign, that's resources that they might have to devote there that they cannot put in Pennsylvania or North Carolina or Arizona or Georgia. Same thing for the Harris campaign. It just seems to me right now the Harris campaign feels a little bit more like it's looking around the map and has a little bit more wherewithal to spread around in case things get close. Uh, well, it helps when you raise $500 million in a matter of weeks, <laughs> right? Uh, they're not going to have unlimited resources, but they're going to have a lot more resources uh, than the Biden campaign did. And, and, and this the, is the Trump the point campaign in, currently has. And the Trump campaign currently has. And so this is the point of the campaign where they start playing chess with the map and mm -hmm. they start doing these kinds of head, head fakes to try to draw the other campaign in for exactly the reason that Serena is just saying, to try and get the other side to spend money defensively, similar to, you know, there's a Senate race in, in Maryland. It's a long shot for Republicans, but if they can get the Democrats to spend money there in what's a very blue state, it's exactly the same calculation that you're talking about. And Sabrina, I found it interesting today that the Harris campaign announced that it was going to hand off $25 million to down-ballot Democratic committees, Senatorial Committee, House Committee, even Attorney General's election committees. What does that tell you? Well, it shows us how much things have shifted from when this was the Biden campaign that, that was at the top of the ticket. I mean, the conversation just two months ago was about, oh, reverse coattails, was about, oh, how could down-ballot candidates be helping Biden win re-election? And now it's a conversation of, oh, no, like— Harris at the top of a ticket can help some of can help bring attention to some races across the country. And I think it's important to note that it's not just in the traditional battleground states, but them sort of branching out and saying, oh, there's competitive races across the country in states that might not be a battleground state, might not be a state that, that Harris is going to win, but they still can help push some people over in those down ballot races. And yet, Molly, I find it interesting the messaging from the Harris campaign is we're still the underdog. Even General Mally Dillon was, I think, quoted in kind of a slightly maybe clumsy, unintentional way last week. We don't see a path to victory. Clearly they do. They have to see some path to victory. But this idea that don't take anything for granted and we are still behind, even though the national polling indicates a rebound for the prospects of Democrats at the top and down ballot. I mean, this is a campaign where I think you can't really say anyone is in the driver's seat just because it is so close. But this is also clearly a messaging exercise, right? Uh, they are not behind at this moment in either the national or the swing state polling, so they can't be considered underdogs in that technical sense, but they really, really do not want their supporters to get complacent. And this was a constant refrain at the Democratic convention as well, right? Speaker after speaker saying, you cannot take anything for granted. You've got to work as hard as you can right through election day. Mobilize your friends and supporters. And this is also, uh, I think, to the point of this conversation, the theme of this conversation is how is this campaign different than the Democratic campaign that, that Joe Biden was running? That campaign did not have 
a surfeit of money. It did not have a surfeit of enthusiasm. This is a campaign that has so much enthusiasm that they're trying to direct it. They're trying to say, if you are this enthusiastic, make sure you are working as hard as you can, not just skipping around talking about joy. Sabrina, the next tent poll event in this very truncated campaign is the debate. How is the Harris campaign preparing for that and the Trump campaign? What do you think the stakes are? I mean, the stakes are high, and I think prior to the June debate, there was a conversation about the importance of debates and the significance of debates, and we were sort of questioning, okay, how much do they really matter? I think the June debate showed us they really do matter, um, and they really can have an impact. So I think this is really going to be an opportunity for Harris to show herself as a leader. I think one of, she had to check that box doing the interview with CNN last week and showing that she could talk about the issues, talk about how she's changed. Um, but there is a question of her showing her leadership, her showing how she can face off with Donald Trump. Um, and, and we're going to get to see that firsthand. And then on the Trump side, I mean, it's He's not, we've seen him sort of flake and go back and forth about if he was going to debate to begin with. And that's part of him adjusting to having to run against Kamala Harris, who is a very different candidate than Joe Biden. So I think part of what we're going to see next week is just how does he maneuver around her? Is he able to contain himself when we know that, that he, you know, wants to speak up or speak over her? And just sort of how does it look? Um, because this is really a debate that's going to matter for those people in the middle, those people who are undecided or who are deciding if they're even going to vote at all. And that's really, you know, we know bases are very energized. Mm -hmm. And now, we, you know, Democrats have made up for it with Kamala Harris at the top of the ticket. But there is still that sliver of Americans who don't know what they're going to do come November. And that debate is, the, is a moment for them to decide. Well said. Sabrina Rodriguez, Molly Ball, as always, great to have you with us. Thank you. A New York man is sentenced for making thousands, yes, thousands of threatening calls to Capitol Hill. Our Scott McFarlane is standing by with the details. That's next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. A New York man has learned his fate, his judicial fate, not his existential fate, for making more than 12,000 harassing and threatening phone calls to congressional offices. His name is Uday Salim Lilly, and he's of Queens. And he was sentenced this afternoon to 13 months behind bars. Among the many threats, prosecutors say he told one congressional staffer that he was going to kill them. Back in May, Lilly pleaded guilty to a federal charge of making interstate threats. For more, let's bring in our Scott McFarlane, who joins us, as you can see, just outside the Justice Department. Scott, why does this case attract our attention and put it in the context of this lar larger conversation about threats against lawmakers? Yeah, Major, this was a profound, prolific case. According to the court documents, Lilly made about 12,000 harassing menacing, sometimes threatening calls to congressional staff and congressional members, reaching more than 50 different congressional offices across the country. That is just a high volume of calls, a large number of threats. It stands out. But in the broader context, it takes some outsized importance, Major, because it's happening at a time of political toxicity, of political violent threats, and it's happening as the number of threat investigation jumps by orders of magnitude involving members of Congress and other elected officials. And it's happening as we get closer and closer to a divisive election. All of this underscores the significance of federal prosecutions. They're trying to provide some deterrence to stop people from this type of dangerous, menacing behavior. But it also underscores just how big a threat this is. These are threats issued in so many cases, Major, to young people, to young congressional staff, to interns manning the phones. Getting death threats is a reality. It's causing quite an impact on Capitol Hill. Scott, very quickly, do the court documents say anything about motive or if the recipients of these threats were of one political party or another more than the other? The charging documents and the sentencing memos don't underscore a political motive, more of an anti-government sentiment based on what they're saying in the court documents. He was somebody particularly frustrated and venting anger at government and institutions. And that's consistent with what Capitol Police see. They see a cross-political, almost an apolitical number of threats in so many cases coming from anti-government zealots or people who have animus towards the government itself. Scott, you have some very new reporting. It's quite interesting about Democratic members of Congress hoping that they gain a political bump from Tim Walls now that he's on the presidential ticket as running mate to Kamala Harris. Angie Craig of Minnesota, Congresswoman, talked to you about the Walls factor. Walk us through her experience and possibly her expectations. 
And to do so, let me walk you down Pennsylvania Avenue, just a short ways <laughs> to the Capitol, where there are two congressional districts where Tim Walls might have outsized significance. Obviously, with the one and only battleground race in Minnesota, always competitive in Minnesota's second district, and in Omaha, Nebraska is Tim Walls's boyhood home. He was campaigning there in mid-August, trying to leverage that, and there's a battleground race in the Nebraska second district. Angie Craig perennially has close races, fighting for her fourth term in a battleground area south of Minneapolis. She texted Tim Walls nine days before he was named to the ticket, saying, I never lose when you're atop the ticket, Tim. This would be a good thing. It also leads into some of our other reporting, Major, that House members were advocating for Tim Walls to get on this ticket. House members who used to call then Congressman Walls a colleague. In Nebraska, Don Bacon is the Republican fighting to keep his seat. Always a tough race there. He told me he was more concerned about Josh Shapiro because he believed Shapiro had a more moderate set of positions that would resonate more with his constituents more so than the native ties of Tim Walls. But Tony Vargas, the Democrat seeking to oust Bacon, said Tim Walls is going to give momentum towards his efforts to oust the Republican. All this comes into play, Major, because, of course, any two or three races can swing so much in the U.S. House, where Republicans have such a narrow margin they're trying to protect in November. Four seats. Exactly, the Republican margin with the legal details and the political insights. Scott McFarland, we thank you very, very much. Some families of fallen soldiers defend former President Trump after his Arlington Cemetery visit. More on that next. You are streaming America Decides. Some Gold Star families are defending former President Trump after his visit to Arlington National Cemetery last week, which some critics thought was overtly political. Some of them, these Gold Star families, are also criticizing Vice President Harris in an ad released by the Trump campaign. Where were you and Joe Biden on August 26, 2024? Nowhere near Arlington Cemetery. President Trump shows up. But President Trump takes the time to hear our loved ones' stories. James Laporta joins us now. He is a verification producer for CBS News Confirmed Team. That's our fact-checking unit. James, you have talked with and met with some of the families from Abbey Gate, the victims there. What have they expressed to you about their attitudes or possibly anger toward the Biden administration, and if anything at all, about this current controversy? Sure. So I've had dinner with the families a couple of times, particularly after they testified on Capitol Hill about the bombing itself. And there's a real anger there. And it's pure raw emotion. I mean, these families have, uh, their lives and these families have been permanently shattered um, uh, by the Afghanistan war and particularly how the war concluded. And they're angry, they're legitimately angry about uh, President Biden's foreign policy decisions during the withdrawal. Uh, you know, in particular, there's criticism of the U.S. relying on the Taliban to secure the outer perimeter of the airport. There's criticism that because of the lack of security uh, during the withdrawal, it, uh, it set basically the stage for a bombing to occur. And, you know, over the years, uh, the, you know, the Biden administration, the White House has largely moved on from Afghanistan. Um and so you don't really hear about it much until these anniversaries come around, until, you know, these three years, um, we're now at the three-year mark. And that's been a criticism, too. I mean, there's been no State of the Union address where President Biden has addressed the ending of the 20-year war. And so these families are, are, are angry about how the 20-year war in Afghanistan concluded. And James... Talk to us about Section 60 within Arlington National Cemetery and the overall rules about photographing anything that personnel there regard as even potentially political. Sure. So Arlington National Cemetery, uh, get, uh, get, they get tens of thousands of visitors uh, every year, people who are tourists to Washington, D.C., people from around the world. You know, they go and they visit the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, or they might go visit, you know, um, where uh, John F. Kennedy is. 
Uh, but Section 60 is is uh, is different. You, you don't typically, in, in my in the times that I've been there, you don't typically see tourists there um, or you know people visiting from around the world. Uh, what you find is family members or friends or relatives who have lost loved ones in the recent wars, particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan. I, I personally have friends who are buried there from my time in service. So Section 60 is, is where we bury um, our recent fallen, uh, from, particularly from the recent post-9-11 wars of Iraq and Afghanistan. In terms of filming, um, Arlington National Cemetery makes it quite clear that you are not allowed to film anything um, that would sponsor a political party or, or any sort of ad. And that's where the Trump administration, or excuse me, the Trump campaign overstepped. And as I understand it, James, if you are to be visiting Section 60 or any part of Arlington National Cemetery in this kind of capacity, these rules, and very quickly, give me an answer on this, are explained to you up front. Uh, correct. Um, it was very, uh, before the Trump campaign uh, visited uh, Arlington National Cemetery, it was very clear to them that they were not allowed to do this. It was perfectly fine for him to go to the tomb of the unknown soldier and go to Section 60 and visit, but it was not okay for them to turn it into a political ad. James Laporta, thank you very much. Question, is he anti-abortion champion or something else? Donald Trump works to clarify his stance on this big issue as some Republicans struggle with conflicting statements. You are streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Here is a quote you don't hear every day. You ready? I feel like Satan is running his campaign, unquote. Those are the words of a prominent anti-abortion activist about Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump. Her voice is featured in a new article from Notice, exploring the growing divide within the anti-abortion movement caused by former President Trump's it's fair to say, mixed messages on this issue. In response to that quote, a spokesperson for the Trump campaign told Notice the former president has clearly and consistently said, quote, the issue of abortion should be decided by the people in their respective states, not by the federal government in D.C. Notice reporter and co-author of this article, Oriana Gonzalez, is here in our D.C. studio. Great to see you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, it... I think I understand the context of that quote, but uh, flesh it out for us, please. Absolutely. This, discon this uh, discontent amongst the anti-abortion advocates has been brewing for quite a while. Uh, we saw it particularly grow when um, Trump said that abortion was a state's issue. Uh, then after that, he changed the Republican platform and got rid of decades-old language calling for a federal abortion ban. And so what's going on is that anti-abortion leaders are kind of flabbergasted because they were, they were like, oh, this is the guy that in 2016 and in 2020 courted us. He promised us uh, at least a federal 20-week abortion ban. He told us that he would change the judiciary to change and uh, overturn Roe v. Wade. And now we see him kind of moderating that position. And that, you know, we're not blind to this. Since the Dobbs decision, poll after poll keeps showing that voters support abortion access. And so Trump and other Republicans, too, are kind of dancing around the issue, trying to figure out how to best message. And where Trump has landed specifically is saying, you know, that he's a moderate on it, that it's a state's issue, that six weeks is too short, uh, and that... Or that's in reference to the Florida... Precisely, law. yeah. Yeah, he was specifically saying that Florida's six-week ban was too short, and that created just a ton of backlash coming at him from anti-abortion leaders who saw him initially as, initially as their guy, mm -hmm. as their advocate, and they just don't think of him as that anymore. They think of him as, like, the best option compared to Kamala Harris, but not the number one. And is this having a material effect on either energy, activism, or just general sense of support for the former president in these crucial days leading up to November 5th. Absolutely. I mean, we know that this election is going to be tight. Every single vote counts here. And the anti-abortion movement has been a big part of the conservative uh, coalition, I guess, since, you know, for decades at this point. And what we know and what I've heard, frankly, from a lot of anti-abortion advocates is that, you know, when we look at the people in this movement, they, a lot of them are single-issue voters. 
And so, you know, what is Trump doing here? It looks, some anti-abortion uh, leaders say, that he's alienating that part of his base. And again, every single vote counts in November. Like, the, 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 the election could be decided by just a couple of, a handful of votes at this point. So really, is he going to continue this rhetoric where he, you know, risks losing that part of his base that he definitely got in 16 and 20? Or is he going to start appealing more to that base and then potentially getting the abortion rights side a lot more fired up? And it doesn't appear there's any clean way out for Trump on this, because if he switches, then everyone in suburban and exurban America, crucial parts of the election demographics, look at that and say, OK, he's veering hard right and response to his base. If he doesn't, he risks deepening this alienation. Oh, absolutely. And we already know that the abortion, abortion rights has been a winning topic, a winning issue for Democrats. And they're really pushing, not only that they're the party that will protect abortion access, but they're pushing the message that Trump is going to lead to a federal abortion ban, that all 50 states are going to ban abortion because of him, because, you know, he, con he continues to brag that, you know, he's the reason why Roe v. Wade got overturned. And so where we are right now is this kind of uh, situation for the GOP where they're, and I've heard this before, they're the dog that caught the car. Before, when Roe v. Wade was in place, they really had that cushion to go as far as they could in their messaging, to really say, I don't like this decision, I want to ban abortion, knowing that because of Roe, there, there was always going to be something for them to fall on, to blame, because the, as to why they couldn't get there. Now, I think what they didn't expect is that voters really, truly care about abortion. And Democrats are really taking that advantage. On both sides, they care. Very dialed in on this topic. Oriana Gonzalez, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I hope you have taken careful note that nowhere in this show have you heard a reference to this period after Labor Day being, quote, the traditional start of the general election campaign, or that we are entering the final sprint, or the home stretch. You didn't hear, hear those references for two reasons. One, they are cliches, and I detest cliches, though television tends to traffic in them with annoying frequency. That's a topic for another day. The biggest reason these shop-worn phrases have been ignored tonight is because they simply do not apply. This race for the presidency began July 21st. In case you need reminding, that is the day President Biden instantly transformed himself from president and presumptive nominee for re-election to lame duck president and decider of the Democratic Party's 2024 presidential nominee. Biden waited so long to end his campaign that his endorsement of Vice President Kamala Harris might as well have been a benediction, a laying on of the hands that deterred every ambitious, presidentially-minded Democrat, and there are plenty of them, from even considering a challenge to the freshly anointed Harris. There has never been a shorter campaign for the presidency in the primary era. The only thing comparable in terms of a vice president stepping in for a president who backed out of a bid for re-election occurred in 1968. But even then, Vice President Hubert Humphrey announced his campaign on April 27th. Just for historical purposes, the modern era of presidential primaries began in 1952. Interestingly, that year... The Democratic convention drafted Adlai Stevenson of Illinois after party bosses decided the winner of the primaries, Tennessee's Estes Kefauver, was simply too much of a maverick to be trusted. Stevenson won on the third convention ballot back in 1952. But that was the dawn of the primary system for the presidency, and parties and the nation still expected party bosses and the delegates who took their cues from those bosses to handpick the nominee, not voters in primaries. That, interestingly, is what has happened this time, except there was only one party boss, Biden, and he decided so late as to make this genuinely a campaign like no other. It is a startling sprint where all traditional sense of timing has been rendered meaningless. The campaign has been a sprint since July 21st. There is no traditional start to it. There never was. Home stretch. it started, just to extend the horse racing metaphor for a second, three furlongs from the finish. The pace of things could not be faster. The time to process the choices and alternatives crammed into precious few weeks. These times, in other words, can make no room for cliches or language that suggests this is all much like what came before it. It is not. That does it for today. We'll be back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. The Daily Report with John Dickerson starts right now.